Eddie? Uh, good to see you. Thank you for joining me for today's uh, weekly COVID-19 update. And since we're uh, doing it weekly now, of course, there's a lot of business to uh, cover today. Uh, a lot of uh, news and reports that I think are important for everyone uh, to receive. Uh, I'm glad to be joined by uh, Dr. Jennifer Dillahay of the uh, Department of Health. Uh, Secretary Romero is out on a committee meeting. We have Secretary Mike Preston of Department of Commerce who will give a report on uh, unemployment, uh, uh, lost wages compensation. Secretary Solomon Graves, a brief report uh, on our prisons. And uh, did I say Secretary Johnny Key from Education uh, for a report on the schools. But first, uh, this is International Week of the Deaf, uh, and we are glad to honor and express appreciation to uh, those uh, uh, who have that uh, uh, disability. And we, Eddie she Schmeckenbecker, I always say it Eddie, but it's Schmeckenbecker, <laughs> Uh, is uh, with us, who's always done a great job as a teacher and administrator of the School of the Deaf, and uh, has uh, been with me side by side uh, through this pandemic. But we have four students from the School of the Deaf today. Uh, Tenley Lees, if they would all come back here, and age five from North Little Rock. We have Braden Cantrell, age nine of Melbourne, Everlyn Solis, age six, of Little Rock, and Jermi Jermichael Jordan, age 11, of Redfield. And Eddie will interpret in reverse fashion as these students sign, and they have a special message for everyone. So Eddie, I think you might need to come to the podium up here. You're going to, oh, he's going to do it from over there. Okay, that makes sense. So uh, go ahead, students. Hello, I'm Tenley. I wear a mask to protect myself and to protect my friends alike. Hello, I'm Evelyn. I wash my hands with soap and water and I use disinfectant again and again and again to keep me safe and healthy. Hello, I'm Braden. I practice social distancing of six feet in the classroom, in the hallways, in the cafeteria, and in the dorms where I live during the week. On the weekends, at home, I do the same thing. Hello, I'm Jermichael. Thank you, Governor, and thank you, community, for your responsibility to help the people be safe in school and at home. Our word at the school this year is encourage, and I want to share that with all of you. We can learn together, we can be safe together, and we can get through this together. Go Leopards! Uh, thank you, students, and uh, thank you, Eddie, uh, for that good reminder for everyone uh, today. And uh, with that, let's go to the uh, case report. Uh, and in the last 24 hours, we've had an additional 486 cases, uh, which uh, is 21 correctional and 465 in the community. That brings this cumu cumulative total of cases to 74,772. Uh, we've had 12 additional hospitalization that brings us to 459. And we have 12 additional deaths that brings us to 1,060. 
In terms of our testing, we've had 6,810 PCR tests. So it was another strong day of testing. And whenever you look at the uh, level of testing with 486 cases, which is down from yesterday, uh, we are pleased with that positivity rate continuing to decline. Uh, the antigen tests, we did 651 antigen tests. And so as the week progresses, you see that uh, increasing. 112 positives out of those antigen uh, quick response tests. Um, and if we, let's go to the uh, slides and I think we'll be able to see all of this in a different way. And here again, you can see uh, where uh, we are in our last uh, uh, bar graph at 400 and some in cases, which is down from yesterday uh, fairly significantly. And uh, let's go to the trend. And because we're down today, it dipped down in terms of our seven-day rolling average trend line. Uh, I'm pleased with that. Hopefully tomorrow, if it goes down in numbers, we're going to continue that trend down. We'll see what happens. Uh, and here's the active cases, which uh, we've had a number recover. And so that has uh, dipped down the last 24 hours. But before that, it's gone up. And so we something we'll continue to watch. Hospitalizations, you can see uh, that uh, that is a upward trend right now in hospitalizations, not where we have been at the peak. We've got some margin there, but uh, we hope that uh, this lagging indicator, which indicates increased hospitalizations because of the increased cases uh, that are coming from a week and two weeks ago, uh, we hope as we reduce the cases, that will go down as well. And then uh, this is the seven-day rolling average of PCR tests, the percent positive. Of course, uh, note the 10% uh, marking there uh, that we've been down from that a long time. This is sort of the uh, good news uh, from uh, where we are in the state with a declining positivity rate. We hope that that will continue to, to decline. And this is the, uh, uh, where we are in terms of our PCR test for the month. Uh, we'll continue to look at that. We had set as a goal 180,000 uh, PCR test, uh, which is uh, we're, we're going to make that without any challenge. Uh, we're having a good month in testing. Uh, and then if you look at the uh, next one, you'll see the antigen test. And we, again, we've exceeded our goal already, which we'd set at uh, 10,000. Uh, so we've exceeded that. And, and that's what I predicted with the new antigen machines in, that we're going to see more people taking advantage of that. It's a quick response. And it's getting, uh, a gaining, a gr a growing in acceptance uh, across the country and here in Arkansas. And so this we're putting out there, we've invested in for people to take advantage of, and they are. And particularly with our education system, uh, moving uh, and continuing, that's uh, helpful to them. The percent positive, of course, it's higher uh, on the uh, antigen test, and uh, uh, that's just the way it is, but uh, we're glad people are getting that test. And then let's look at it from regions for a moment. Uh, this just gives you a picture of the different health regions, the five different health regions across Arkansas, and then we're going to look at the trend lines for each of those regions. Here is the seven-day rolling average uh, of cases by region. And here, you've got to spend a little bit of time on it. Uh, but of course, the top line uh, in the orange is the northwest, uh, which you know it peaked, it's down, it's gone back up, and it's, uh, we'll see where it goes. But obviously, that increase was from probably the University of Arkansas College campuses going back. Uh, if you look at the next line, it is the yellow, which is central Arkansas, another high population area. Uh, it's down from its peak, but uh, we've got to watch it. Uh, you look at uh, the next is the blue, which is the northeast. That is a trend that we're concerned about because they've had one of the highest growth areas in terms of COVID cases. And it's almost equaling uh, where we are in central Arkansas. <clears throat> and then the red is uh, south, southeast. And it's speak, <clears throat> spiked up. But uh, that's probably as a result of some of the increase in the prison system. 
and the green in southwest is flat, which is the lowest number. It looks good. And then this is the growth rate for, uh, by public health region uh, in terms of uh, the percent growth rate from September 3 to September 19. And here the northeast, as I mentioned, is the highest growth rate at 7.4 percent, uh, followed by central 5.7, northwest 5.5, and, uh, and staircases get down from there. And then next you'll see this, the same uh, except by age group. And this gives us information as the highest growth rate is the 18 to 24, the college age students, 7.6 growth rate during that September 13 to September 19 period, uh, followed by uh, 65 plus, uh, followed by 0 to 17. And so no age group is immune. We all have to be careful. Now, I mentioned that today I want to talk about uh, the future for a moment and our strategies for the future. And uh, you've heard Dr. Fauci and others say that with flu season coming on, that uh, uh, with the cold weather, uh, it could be a very difficult time that we're uh, going to come into uh, here in the late fall and winter months. And I want everybody in Arkansas to be prepared uh, for what's ahead and uh, to continue our focus because we're going to be uh, living with COVID for some time, but as everyone knows, we're increasing our activity from school uh, to sports, uh, and we want to continue that, but we can't lose focus of our strategy. So I wanted to outline some of our winter strategies. And first of all, we want to, our goal is to increase public flu shot participation. And so tomorrow, I'll be getting my flu shot. Uh, joined by, I believe, the Surgeon General, and uh, I'll be getting the, my flu shot here. We want everyone to get their flu shot. It helps you to be prepared for the winter season. Secondly, our goal is to perform 1 million COVID-19 tests by October 20th. Currently, we have performed since the beginning 897,000 uh, PCR tests here in this state. Uh, we're looking forward to reaching the 1 million uh, mark in PCR test, and we, our goal is to have that accomplished by October 20th. If we stay on target to that, it helps us uh, to prepare for the winter months to be able to identify uh, any uh, spread that we have to address. Third, we want to increase the consistency of our state contact tracing. Stephanie Williams is here, our chief of staff who will outline that we're making some progress in our contact tracing in terms of our timelines, trying to make them more effective and meaningful. That is a focus of our strategy. Fourth is to emphasize continued wearing of masks and social distancing. While we're tired of it and we uh, get numb by the talking about it, it is still effective, it is necessary, uh, we're adopting it, but we cannot lose that focus. And the school children have really set the example for us. Wearing masks at school, uh, not intimidated by it, they do that, young people do that. We have to continue to follow uh, that uh, very helpful practice. And as I say there, lead by example. Uh, it's interesting that in the NFL, uh, some of the coaches uh, in the NFL were not wearing a mask on the sidelines when they're supposed to and uh, they were fined $100,000. Well, we're not going to be fining anybody $100,000, but they're trying to emphasize we lead by example. Uh, people see this, and so uh, we want to, if you're a leader, if you're in the community, set that example. And then finally, part of the strategy is do not grow weary. Uh, it is easy to do that. It is easy to get overwhelmed with that. We can't grow weary in this. We have to be consistent because so much is at stake, and we can see hope on the horizon uh, with uh, the possibility of a vaccine uh, coming uh, hopefully soon, even though it'll take some time to get that uh, distributed across the state and available for everyone. Winter strategies, I hope that is helpful to you. And now, uh, let me uh, turn it over first, since we have this up here, to Stephanie Williams. Uh, to follow up uh, with uh, discussion briefly <coughs> on uh, our strategy in contact tracing. 
thank you, Governor. And the, the slide is not a pretty slide, but it gives you the three basic parts of the contact tracing process. And as the Governor said, it's a key part of our strategy. We look at the process every week. We study it in detail every week. And so this just gives you a, a little bit of a frame of reference for the timeline. We want to do it quickly and efficiently. So the first thing is lab. The lab sampling, running the lab um, sample, getting the result transmitted to the department for action. The first block of time there, three days, nine hours, and 23 minutes. This is an average of the times that we're receiving commercial lab, our public health lab, and the antigen testing. So there's variability there, but that's just to give you an idea. Is it going to take a few days to get it into the queue for action? Once it enters the department as a lab result, then we've dramatically decreased the time for action. We've got one day, 17 hours and 49 minutes. So less than two days for it to be entered into the lab system, investigated by a nurse, and then moved on for contact tracing. Once it moves to our team of contact tracers, we've got it down to under a day, 23 hours and 10 minutes. So we've dramatically decreased the amount of time it takes to act on this information. Um, Dr. Romero, Secretary Romero, challenges us to look at this and improve it every week, as does the governor. So we will continue to do so, but that just gives you a little bit of the idea of the process that we're making. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, and thank you, Governor. <clears throat> So I would like to add to some of the information that the governor provided in terms of the uh, numbers of cases. So as he said, we had 486 new cases this year, I mean this day. Um, yesterday we had 596, so we've had 110 fewer cases today. And there were 465 in the community and 21 are in correctional facilities. So that gives us a total of 74,772 confirmed cases. We also have a total of 2,209 probable cases, which is an increase of 131 since yesterday. And that gives us a uh, of 6,188 uh, confirmed active cases in the community. With regard to hospitalizations, there are 459 uh, people in the hospital. That's an increase of 12 since yesterday. 88 of them are on the ventilator, which is a decrease of 9 since yesterday. We've had 1,060 deaths in Arkansas due to COVID-19, and that is an increase of 12 since yesterday. One was from a nursing home, and otherwise there was no clustering related to these deaths. Fortunately, we've had a large number of people recover. There are 67,519 recovered, which is an increase of 585 since yesterday. Uh, our testing shows that we had 6,810 tests reported yesterday. That gives us a cumulative average for our PCR test positivity rate of 8.3, which as the governor noted is well under our goal of 10%. Uh, these specimens came from the health department, which contributed 2,272 uh, uh, test results from the um, commercial labs was 4,340 test results and UMS was 198. So our total monthly cumulative as of, as of today uh, are 163,704 PCR test results. Did you give the uh, top five counties? Yes, so the top five counties are um, Pulaski County, which was 80, Benton County, which is 55, Craighead County, which is 30, Sebastian County, 28, and Washington County of 26. So I'd like to take just a moment to say a little bit about the flu shot. The flu vaccine given as a shot is effective and safe. It 
protects about half the people who get the flu shot from completely getting the flu at all. Those that do get the flu will have milder cases and it goes a long way toward keeping people out of the hospital. And that is something that in the time of a COVID pandemic, it's very important to do. We all need to take steps to stay out of the hospital. So we strongly encourage people to get the flu shot this year. Our local health units beginning yesterday began providing flu vaccine to anyone who would walk up it's a walk-up flu clinic, and some local health units are also providing drive-up flu clinics. Um, there will be no cost, no out-of-pocket cost to the patient. Uh, if you have insurance, please bring the information. We would like to recoup some of our costs and bill your insurance. But no one will be turned away for inability to pay. People can also get their flu vaccines at uh, local pharmacies or their doctors and we strongly encourage everyone to get their flu vaccine this year before the end of October. So thank you. Thank you. Secretary Key. Thank you, Governor. Uh, today uh, marks uh, the, uh, about the middle of the fifth week of school and during that time we have seen um, 106 schools that have had some type of modified operations uh, since uh, the school began. Uh, the good news is 83 of those uh, have already moved back to normal operation. We currently have 23 schools that have some type of modification. Uh, which could include blended learning or virtual learning for their school. It could also include uh, a, a classroom. It could include a grade level. It, it could go up to include the entire school or district. Uh, so it's a very fluid situation. Uh, but of those current uh, 23, one of those is from a water line break. So as you can see, not uh, in, in earlier when we had weather incidences, uh, not every one of these situations is directly related to COVID but currently 22 uh, are related directly to COVID. Uh, we continue to work with districts uh, with their plans. Uh, they are in the process of reviewing after the first four weeks of school. It has given them a good opportunity to look at their data, uh, to look at their practices and processes to see where their plans can be improved and improvements uh, are, are being made, uh, working locally with their uh, administrators and school districts and educators. Uh, so we would just encourage our, our districts, our parents, our caregivers out there, and our students to continue. Uh, as the governor said, don't grow weary. Uh, we have seen a, a successful beginning to the school year. We think that we can continue having a successful school year if we pay attention to the precautions that have been set forth by the health department. Uh, and we will continue working with districts as modifications become necessary. Thank you, Governor, for your continued leadership uh, dur during this COVID-19 pandemic. I uh, wanted to update everyone on the continued challenges this virus poses within the Department of Corrections. As of this afternoon, we have 379 active cases within the department. That is down from our peak high of case counts of 1,001 at the end of July. Of today's active cases, we have seven inmates that are uh, being treated in an outside hospital. Of those, two inmates are on a ventilator. Throughout the course of the pandemic, we have had 182 inmates that have been hospitalized. Unfortunately, uh, 39 inmates have passed away due to COVID-related illnesses, with 36 of those being in a hospital and three of those passing away within one of our correctional facilities. Earlier this month, we did uh, resume the intake of male inmates, which was suspended uh, at uh, early June uh, due to the outbreak at our Washita River unit in Malvern. We're currently bringing inmates in in cohorts of 48. Those inmates are being held in quarantine for 14 days. During the course of their 14-day quarantine, they will be tested um, at a minimum of three times, one of those upon intake, uh, once uh, at the approximate halfway point and the final test being administered 
uh, about two to three days before they complete their 14-day quarantine. If an inmate uh, tests positive, then they are held in isolation for an additional period of time, along with those inmates who were um, exposed to them in their cohort group. The remaining tests that are being administered within the department are being administered for those inmates who uh, display symptoms consistent with COVID-19. We're also continuing to test inmates uh, before they are released from our custody, either due to parole or the discharge of their sentence. And finally, we are testing inmates as a result of a direct di exposure to a confirmed positive uh, case. Uh, specific to the uh, men and women who work within the uh, department and those that uh, reside within our uh, within one of our correctional facilities i want to echo the governor's sentiments about not growing weary um, this covid 19 pandemic has lasted longer than any of us would have want wanted as the governor said there is a hope in the future as a result of uh, vaccine vaccines and other medical developments specific to COVID. But we must continue to be vigilant with, our, with the wearing of our face coverings, with sanitation, uh, with uh, basic cough, cough hygiene, those little things that we have heard so much of these past few months, we know work and we know are essential to saving the lives of all of our loved ones, um, especially in my case, those men and women who are housed within our facilities. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor. Eddie, thank you for what you're doing. I'll do my best to speak a little slower today. And, um, just wanted to give a quick update on the Lost Wages Assistance Program. And um, a big thank you to all those in the media who have, who have covered this in the last couple of weeks. It is a complex program. And uh, you all have worked closely with myself and my team to, to get that information out there uh, and deliver to our Kansans who may be eligible for this program. Uh, to date, we are started to uh, pay into the second week of the program. Again, we have been approved for the first three weeks uh, by FEMA. Uh, we hope to start making the third week of payments here in the next few days. To date, we've paid out over $47 million uh, to our Kansans. Uh, the message I want to send out today is uh, with respect to those who are qualified for this program on the regular UI benefits program. For those on the pandemic unemployment assistance who have already been automatically qualified as a result of uh, that program set and being set up uh, as a direct result of COVID-19. Those on traditional unemployment benefits from August 1st through August 22nd must go back in and recertify that their unemployment was due to a result of a COVID-19 impact. That is what will make you eligible for these lost wages assistance um, uh, dollars. Uh, we've sent communication out to all those individuals. Uh, again, the media has done a good job to help us get that information out. Uh, but I want to share with everyone today that you have until this Friday, September 25th, to go back in and certify. We'll need to end it at that point in terms of those on UI going in and recertifying or making that certification so that we can tally up those final numbers and know what we as a state have to put in going forward with our match. So again, those on the regular UI benefits who are eligible from the week of August 1st to the 22nd, you've received communications from the Department of Workforce Services, please go on and certify that your um, unemployment was a result of COVID-19 impact. We need that in order to be able to pay out those funds. They are there, they're available, we just need that certification. Now, on a positive note, we are seeing uh, the numbers continue to tick down in unemployment. Uh, roughly about uh, 37,000 continued claims on unemployment, about 42,000 on the pandemic unemployment. Uh, this is the lowest that we've been since um, uh, probably early May, late April. Uh, so the numbers are continuing in the right direction, which means people are getting back to work in a safe, secure manner. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and uh, to the entire team that's worked very hard through this. I know that was a lot of information, but that's what happens when we do it once a week. With that, we'll uh, be happy to take any questions. Leslie. Okay. Um, so the White House um, estimate on the number of patients per day from Arkansas being hospitalized for a period, a recent period, was 51 a day. So can you explain uh, how those numbers differ from ours 
Uh, if they're correct, it would mean like 40 people being discharged from the hospital a day. So, so um, I think that's a, a conversation probably uh, needs to be happen uh, after afterwards. We'll see if we can't get uh, that information to you a little bit more. I, uh, I, I reviewed the White House report. Uh, carefully, uh, but that uh, particular detail, I think, uh, probably uh, maybe Dr. Uh, Porter uh, can answer that uh, afterwards. Yes. Uh, there was a report in the New York Times today talking about uh, uh, COVID-19 cases in schools, and basically, of the states they could get information on, only Texas has more cases than Arkansas. Just wondering if you've seen that and. Have any idea why we might have more than other states? Or you mean in the schools? Yes, in K through 12 schools. I haven't seen that story, uh, and uh, uh, you know we've had a very good start to our school. Uh, you know the uh, the challenge has not been the positive cases in the school. The challenge has been those that have had to do. Uh, quarantine as a result of a positive case in the school. So I'm not sure where they're getting that uh, information. Be happy to look at it. Uh, do you have any information on that, Secretary Key? Uh, but we've we got a great start. We're happy. Uh, uh, the educators are really seeing the opportunity with the children, and they uh, again the, what they uh, are concerned about is. Uh, the contact tracing and how that impacts uh, the staff and others. But in terms of the number of cases, we have not been uh, uh, concerned about that number particularly. Yes? For the goal to increase consistency of contact tracing, can you tell me a little more specifically what that goal is? Is it to do it faster or what is it? Uh, well, first of all, it, it's a process. And so, uh, while we have greatly added to uh, the number of contact tracers, uh, it's about training them and making sure that uh, it's going smoothly and quickly and that we have a quality assurance review so that uh, they are acted timely. Uh, for example, uh, do you call five times in a row to someone that's not answering the phone or do you call one time a day for five days? Uh, that was a difference between how that was being approached and we found out what was most successful. And so we implemented that. Uh, that's an example of how we can shorten that time frame. Uh, so it's about the training. It is about uh, smoothing out that process. It's, uh, uh, and also it's about controlling the number of cases. You know, if you have a thousand new cases in one day, it's going to be a slower response time. Uh, versus having, like today, a, half that number uh, in terms of who we have to investigate and have the contact tracing on. Uh, but that's the goal, is to decrease uh, the amount of time uh, before uh, we resolve those issues. Did you have anything else to add to that, Stephanie? Okay. Is there uh, any other question remotely? Hey, Governor, it's Phil Smells with KNWA in Fayetteville. So I need to I turn that up just a second. For, you. for the first one, I'm hoping you can provide me with some clarification. On the Health Department's COVID dashboard listed next to confirmed and probable deaths, we see that there are five non-COVID deaths. So we're just wondering what exactly that means. And then also, uh, President Donald Trump, he announced plans to announce his nominee for the late Justice Ginsburg's seat on Saturday. Republicans, they indicate they have the votes to confirm that person. So do you think that we should be appointing someone to the Supreme Court prior to the November election? Uh, thank you. And I'll ask Dr. Porter to answer the first part of your question on the uh, uh, graph that we put out. Thank you. So regarding the uh, information, uh, the non-COVID deaths, some of those could be attributed to um, other mechanisms such as motor vehicle crashes, suicide, and other type of deaths that not, you know, a person may have had a positive test, but that, uh, that decedent or the, uh, the death event had nothing to do with uh, COVID-19 specifically. Thank you. In terms of the Supreme Court nominee, I'm excited to hear the announcement later in this week as to who the president selects. 
the president is doing his constitutional responsibility uh, to name a nominee when there's a vacancy. Uh, once that's done, the Senate has a constitutional responsibility uh, to hold a hearing and to take a vote. Uh, that should move expeditiously, uh, but it, adequate time for review and uh, appropriate hearings on it. So I think you have to take it a step at a time. If that can be done uh, thoroughly uh, with proper vetting, with a proper hearing uh, before the election, I'm for uh, fulfilling the uh, Constitution uh, that uh, directs uh, that process. So uh, I don't think it should be tied to the election. I think it should be tied to uh, the constitutional responsibility and continuing to move because obviously uh, that's a decision, uh, that's a, uh, uh, the court has cases before it that's going to make a big difference in the lives of Americans. And we need to have uh, that ninth justice on the court. Hi, Governor. Um, Mercedes McKay with Channel 11 here remotely. This question is probably more addressed to Secretary Key. Um, it's related to what the current substitute teacher situation is in the state because we've heard from several districts that there is a capacity issue. So we just wanted to see what that was like and if there were any state efforts to attract more. So yes, that, that is an ongoing challenge. And really, that is uh, uh, the issue of substitute teachers and the capacity uh, is usually a local issue anyway. And there are some districts that traditionally ha have challenges doing that. Uh, so, but right now, what we are asking schools and districts to look at is, uh, as they have seen that first four weeks uh, and into the fifth week now, and seeing what that availability uh, can be on a district by district level. Uh, what are the other um, modifications they could make? What are uh, the changes to their plan, their ready for learning plan that might be necessary now that they have four weeks behind them? And the availability of substitute teachers is uh, certainly one of the factors. Uh, so at this point, there is not a, a statewide effort because the recruiting of substitute teachers is very much a local uh, uh, has local flavor, has local connotations. It's, uh, uh, you know, we could recruit substitute teachers, uh, but it would be very difficult for a statewide uh, campaign, so to speak, uh, to really solve the needs of a substitute teacher shortage in, say, McGee. Uh, so we are continuing to work with the districts to uh, help them identify what other possible changes they could make to the Ready for Learning plan. Uh, in order to compensate for any shortages that they may have uh, as well as in substitutes as well as the impact that they are seeing right now on close contacts that in many cases take those teachers uh, out for 14 days uh, for, for their quarantine period. But it's something that we continue to keep an eye on and we continue to receive feedback from districts on. Leslie? ago, was that your position when President Obama, your constitutional position when President Obama did nominate but the Senate refused to hold a hearing on his nominee to the Supreme Court? Uh, yes, I understand. Is there a question? Was that your position, the position you expressed today that it was a constitutional duty, your position then in 2016? Uh, I believe that I've uh, advocated for following the Constitution consistently, uh, including four years ago. Uh, I don't know whether I actually made any public statements on it or not, uh, but uh, uh, that's my statement today. Uh, is there any other question I've missed? Uh, Governor, this I is have uh, a Andrew with AP. Um, I want to ask you about the White House Task Force report. I uh, wanted to see what you thought about uh, the uh, the state's rate of new, new cases are now, now up to the fourth in, in the country. It's been it's been going up. You know how big of a concern is that at this point? As well as the, the recommendation in there, where they said there needs to be strengthened compliance with uh, mitigation efforts. I want to see how do you think the state can can achieve that, or do you do that in terms of increased enforcement? What what exactly are you looking? Uh, thank you, Andrew, and a very good question. Uh, first, in terms of the number of cases, that's the 
bad news that uh, we had in the report. Uh, that's obviously too high of a weekly uh, growth in cases. Uh, that's why we're working every day to uh, get that down. And I was pleased with a uh, decreased number the last few days. Uh, but that is a concern. We want uh, fewer cases uh, and we want to slow that growth uh, and we hope that we can make progress there. Uh, the good news, of course, uh, which you didn't mention, was the uh, reduction in the positivity rate in Arkansas, which uh, they acknowledge in the report. We continue to, and, and as you continue to see improvements in positivity rate, there's a higher level of confidence that you're going to eventually see a decline in cases. And so we focus on both of those. And part of that is our testing. And if I read the report right, it looked like it was like a 60% increase in testing here in Arkansas one week over the next. Now, that's my look at the uh, report. And so the testing, the reduction, the positivity rate are good news. The uh, concern, as you noted, is the increased number of cases. Some of their recommendations, one is to strengthen compliance efforts. And so uh, we are working on that uh, to both through the Department of Health and strengthen our compliance efforts. Uh, whenever we approve a local event, compliance is a big part of it. And so whether it is the chuck wagon races or whether it is another event, one of the things that we look at in terms of approval of the plan is their compliance and their enforcement and uh, how are they going to not just have a plan but to have uh, that plan executed. And then third part of it, of course, is uh, what we're doing through the inspections that we undertake. And in fact, um, our COVID-19 inspection started on June 29th. And since then, we've had 2,067 inspections that have been conducted of different facilities. 90% uh, are in compliance, so a 90% compliance rate. Of the 10% out of compliance, there were 173 violations found, and uh, that's either accompanied by a verbal warning or citations. And uh, so we're, con and that's made a difference, and we'll continue to emphasize uh, those enforcement efforts as well. And then I heard one more question. Yes, Governor, this is Juliana Clipson with Five News. A um, little bit more of a lighthearted question, but falls here. What does Halloween look like this year? Are you guys giving any guidance as far as trick-or-treating or haunted houses or anything of that matter? Uh, actually, I've already started receiving letters from young people saying, don't cancel Halloween. And uh, uh, we don't plan on canceling Halloween. I don't know that that's within my prerogative to cancel Halloween. Uh, but we are looking at that. And uh, first of all, uh, if you follow our guidelines, then it ought to be a safe Halloween, uh, which is that if you go out socially distanced and wearing a mask, and wearing a mask shouldn't be hard during Halloween. Uh, and so there's ways to do that. If you don't go out and you go to a gathering, then uh, that takes a little bit more serious thought and there are limitations there. We don't want uh, Halloween gatherings of uh, 200, 300 people in a gymnasium uh, and without having a plan approved by the Department of Health. So we will have more to say about Halloween as we get closer, uh, but Halloween will not be canceled this year. Uh, one last question here. The CDC, sorry, I had to take this off. The CDC uh, changed its guidance on uh, how, tra how COVID is transmitted to say it's not majority aerosol. Um, does that worry you that that could make people stop wearing the masks if they, if they think, well, you know, this was, CDC says it's really not aerosol, that's not the main, so why should I have to wear a mask to stop my aerosol? Well, I think their comments uh, actually strengthen the reasons to wear a mask. Is uh, Now, what bother is bothersome is that it's they came out with a revised statement one day, then with it, withdrew it the next, and so they're still evaluating that. We'll see what they say in the end, but I should 
uh, defer to Dr. Delahaye. Do you have any comment on uh, the CDC guidelines there? And that's the most important thing. Uh, this is my team here. We've got WHO guidelines, we've got CDC guidelines, and we've got uh, decision makers that are here that uh, are very uh, high quality epidemiologists, experts in this field. And so uh, our, our guidance has been consistent, wear a mask, and it will stay that way. Thank you all very much.